Okay, so you're listening to the tape played in court as Cheyenne Harris gave a statement to police outside of court. I got Latonia Hines with me from Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, a prosecutor, an Emmy Award winning TV legal analyst, and, and to many, probably the most important credential, a hardcore Gators fan. Latonia, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. Yes. Um, so, so, so what do you think? I mean, th doesn't this statement that she gives kind of minimize because we know there's a plethora of other evidence to show you weren't just worried about turning the temperature up and down. There's maggots crawling on this child. Correct. And totally detached type of testimony that she's giving there. And when you think about it, common sense is going to make you think there's no way that that child was just put there for maggots to form on this child. The child's diaper hadn't been changed for a whole entire week. There's no way to explain that. There's no way that a person who truly is a caring parent can explain why your child would have been in that condition for that long. And talking about, well, it could have been warm, could have been this. Why didn't you ever pick your child up out of that that, uh, that uh, chair for a week? Just yeah. insane. It's awful. Yeah, it really is. And Latonia, I would add to that that the baby was seven pounds, way underweight, uh, malnourished. And this whole idea of having the, the chair turned towards the wall and, and, and uh, sheets put over the windows just looks like an actual deprivation in so many areas. Okay, so Latonia, just so our audience understands, the cause of death is obviously in manner of death very important um, in a case. And a lot of times it can be very dry testimony. Prosecutors usually throw these witnesses in the middle. Uh, there doesn't seem to really be a dispute as to, as to the cause and manner of death. But some uh, medical examiners can really provide a lot of, lot of insight. Some don't, some do. Um, in here, what he's saying is that the denial of critical care, which we talked about already, the manner of death is a homicide. And he stated that within a reasonable degree of medical certainty. So we know what his opinion is. Talk to us about what a reasonable degree of medical certainty is. Why do we go through that dance? of asking that question so that there's no doubt as to what you truly believe the reason for the death is and so that there it's almost like elimination of other possible uh causes and so that's what he's done and what he did that i thought was brilliant is that he almost broke it down in a way for the prosecutors also when they start talking about um or when the judge starts talking about the charges about what the elements are there was such a depraved indifference to the life of this child and that the person who owed a duty to the child was the mom and the dad and they owed a duty because as the medical examiner explained an infant can't take care of themselves and any time that you can show that the main things for survival have not been provided by the person who is supposed to be providing that then that shows you that indifference um, and I thought he did a great job but that's why medical certainty that you can pinpoint without a doubt that cause of death. You know, Latonia, let me ask you this question. I think that when you juxtapose what you just said uh, versus the care of the two-year-old who everyone testified seemed healthy, well-fed, clean, um, and, and that this baby seemed to be put in this, like the chairs turned towards a wall, blankets over the windows, depriving it of sunlight, left in a diaper for nine to 14 days in the state of disrepair, malnourished, dehydrated. It, it almost gets to a point of, of just clearly premeditated, purposeful murder, not just neglect. And what you'll find sometimes too, Bob, in some of these like abuse cases, you will find sometimes that one of the other children is treated well. It's almost like one child is the target child. Um, we've talked about this on this network about the Tiffany Moss case that happened here in Georgia, where you've got the other children seem totally well, but Tiffany um, Moss, the mom, totally uh, gave no help or any type of aid to the other other adopted her uh, non biological child, her stepchild. Um, and sometimes that's what happens. And I think that this is one of those cases as well where the abuse is targeted on one particular child while the other children seem to be seemingly fine. Uh, and there's no way to be able to explain around that any better, I, I think. Well, Tony, based on your experience, do you think there becomes, uh, for statistically the average, I'm not saying everyone, an epiphany after the arrest, going to court, listening to this horrible testimony from the first responders, the police and the medical examiner, where the people actually feel remorse um, and are sorrowful, not for what they're going through, but for what they did? Or is there some sort of sick rationalization in their mind that still goes on? I think it's a combination of things. I think you have some people who, if they were drugs on drugs or whatever, and 
they totally had no ability to care because they are just totally consumed with their drugs. Um, and then maybe now that they've been clean for a while, then they realize the magnitude of what's happened. Or you have some people who are just evil. There are some people who are, whether or not you want to call them sociopaths, psychopaths, whatever you want to call it, who just don't have that ability to have that type of empathy and in a sense are narcissistic. The only person they care about is themselves and they'll figure out a way to justify their own actions. And then you have those other people who just want to get off. Like their their only concern now is, oh my goodness, I'm in trouble. I've been caught. How do I get out? Right, right. Excellent, excellent. Well, you know, this case was also fascinating because it was one of the reasons I love trial law is that you always have a little permutation about it. You can learn about a subject matter. One of those things is entomology, right? Because there was a lot that went on here with the process of the flies and laying the eggs and the maggots and, and all the other uh, sequelae, if you will, of the infestation of this child. So let's go take a listen at the interesting testimony in this case of the entomologist because it was important in creating a timeline for the prosecution. I, I don't know about you, Latonia, but this is like some of the most grotesque testimony I've, I've, I've ever heard. I mean, I've done gunshots, stabbings, dismemberments, whatever, but when you're talking about a slow moving process of fly and maggot infestation I I with an infant, which he says takes a long time because of how those diapers are, are uh, constructed, it's pretty gruesome. It's disgusting. It is so very upsetting when you hear this type of testimony because what you realize is the child didn't die right then and there. This is like a slow death. Mm. This, by the time that the medical examiners got to this child, um, the medical professionals, this child had lived in this for a good nine days. I mean, you couldn't torture anyone worse than this. This poor baby to sit there in its own excrement and having pests like maggots in there. I mean, how do you explain that away? How does a parent explain that away? You just can't. Yeah, and, and it's like literally sucking the life out of the child, like just just a little bit at a time to a point. And I can tell you as an EMT, I, this is like an amazing thing. You don't, you don't normally see this where a professional goes there, the baby's alive, but the eyes are fixated, the extremities are cold, the fists are clenched, and they know that there's nothing they can do to, to revive that baby. It's just that baby was just literally a hair's breadth from the next process, death. It is torture. Yeah, and not only that, you heard what the forensic entomologist said about the scent, the scent of the excrement. So for nine days, they lived there and they smelled and they, and nothing, nothing. They did absolutely nothing. He stated, all it would have taken is if you would have cleaned that diaper one time. Mm. When you clean that diaper that one time with the excrement, whatever that's clean, then the maggots would have went with it. But no, you chose to leave that child like that. Yeah, Just not, and, and it doesn't make a sympathetic defendant when you're listening to it, when you're saying that mental illness is the monster here, not the individual person. And there were two of them, each one of which could have prevented this from happening. Latonia, thanks as always for the great legal analysis. We are doing a segment here on Rewind, Moms That Kill. Stick with us, we're gonna go to break. We'll be right back.